Hey folks, it's Tommy Z with you today. I'm very excited because today marks the beginning of the five-part mini class that I am about to present to you. This will be a, um, a little supplement to the free training that is available at makingmusicforbrands.com. I think it's more than just a little supplement. And I hope that it can introduce you to the world of making music for brands. It can inspire you with new possibilities, show you a bit of the inside of our industry where there are a lot of musicians making money, uh, making music right from their home studio, even at a difficult time like this. And so let's get started, folks. Um, as a way of introduction, I want to tell you why I'm doing this, okay? And basically, today... As you know, many musicians are struggling, right? I mean, we're facing some difficult times today. Um, and I feel like when you are afraid, when you're facing some difficult times, some people have a tendency to panic. I have a tendency to do this, and I have had to ta teach myself in the past how to manage my anxiety, my fear. And I'm actually going to do a, a video about this separately, but... The, the concept that I want to express here is that fear narrows your vision. And so when difficult things are happening, some of us react with fear, which means that we will either try to avoid these issues or we might even panic, okay, and just try to maybe even forget about our dream of being a musician full time. But what professionals do and what I want to encourage you to do is actually face problems, okay? There's always been problems, and we're going to talk about this. And professionals differ from amateurs in the way that they actually face their problems. They face the reality. No matter what the obstacle, no matter what the issue, they try to understand it so that they can actually do something about it. So we're not just going to focus on the problems, folks, and this is why I want to do this training I want you to get inspired by the idea that there are still opportunities and there will, will be plenty more opportunities in the future for musicians just like you, okay? But in order to seize those opportunities, you're going to have to start thinking differently, okay? And so this teaching, I hope, will give you a bit of that flavor. It will give you a bit of a flavor of how we do things on the inside of our academy for those uh, who couldn't join it for whatever reason. All right, folks? So for those of you who don't know my story, I got into this business about 15 years ago. I used to be a banker on Bay Street in Toronto. And I got into music first as a rapper when I was in high school. Uh, then I went from rapping to DJing in university. And actually the DJing got really serious where I was a resident DJ at a lot of famous Toronto clubs. And... But I didn't believe that I could actually make a full-time living from music. And so I kept my day job, which was as a banker on Bay Street for Toronto Dominion Bank. For those of you who are in North America, you will know it. And so I was a banker by day, DJ by night. And then a friend of mine who knew that I was into music and I was starting to make music um, gave me my first commercial. I never even thought about the idea of scoring commercials. And that was a um, campaign for Pontiac Aztec. And when I discovered that you could actually make really good money scoring these campaigns and commercials, I actually went ahead and quit my job thinking, okay, now I know the path. I know exactly what to do. This is what I'm going to do. But unfortunately, I actually struggled a lot to try to get more projects, to try to officially break into the business. And I struggled so much that I actually considered going back to my regular day job. But a friend of a friend um, sat me down. This was an industry insider, showed me the ropes, told me that I'm doing everything wrong. And actually today in the master class, we teach the same things to the students that um, this industry insider taught me. And after that sit down, I actually started to get traction because I started to understand how the business actually works, who do I need to contact, and how do I need to contact them. And a lot of this information I actually reveal in the free training. So 15 years later, here I am. I've produced close to a 1,000 different campaigns uh, for big brands around the world, three different continents. Um, I've been doing this, and we do it under uh, 
production company of my own, which I founded four years ago called Tommy Z and Co. Uh, and before I founded my company, I was a creative director at one of the biggest music production companies in the world called Massive Music. And before then, I was on the other side of the ocean in Toronto as a partner in a, in a music house called Tattoo, which still exists till today. But uh, Tommy Z and Co. is a boutique music production company, which I run. And we deliver songs, scores, and sounds for some of the biggest brands in the world. And we also run an academy, as you're probably aware, where we teach talented musicians how to do what we do how to make a living making music for brands, okay? So I'm going to go through some housekeeping uh, before we start the part one of this mini class, okay? First thing I want to let you know is if you haven't watched the free training, please do so because a lot of things are explained there which I don't want you to ask about during this training. I don't want to repeat myself in various trainings. And so if you haven't watched the free training, please do that. If you did watch the free training and you still have certain questions um, that I'm not going to cover today, please ask them below in the comments and I'll be happy to answer them. Feel free to watch this at one and a half times speed. I tend to do that with YouTube videos, but I encourage you not to skip, okay? You can't skip your way into success. Okay, this is a mindset. Like a lot of you musicians are emotional creatures. I get a lot of emails from you saying, can you please help me out? I have this amazing song. Here's my song. Please put it in a commercial. That's not the way the business works. Okay, this business is full of serious, talented, experienced craftspeople who are actually allergic to this kind of attitude. Like, here's my song, put it in a commercial or here's my song, help me. I don't know what these musicians are thinking, but that's not a way uh, to approach us business people. And one thing that I found among my most successful students is that they don't skip stuff. They pay attention. They take notes. Uh, they get into the material deeply. They ask really good questions and they finish everything they start. Okay, like how you do one thing is how you do everything. And so... I just want you to be aware of yourself and how you approach trainings like this, hoping for a quick answer uh, or hoping for some kind of a formula that will allow you to get rich quick. It ain't going to happen here, folks. Okay, this is a true vocation. This is a true career. There are no shortcuts. You can't sprint your way into this business. It's an ultra marathon. All right. It took musicians on the inside years to establish themselves in this business and so don't think that you can just email someone quickly with your music and that um you know they'll invite you in very quickly that's not the way it works the internet is promising you a lot of uh bullshit and uh maybe some people believe in that but we don't believe in bullshit we're not into bullshit so we're gonna teach it to you exactly the way it is this is a real industry. It's got real musical crafts, people working full time from their home studios, making music for brands. And we're going to teach you the way that it really is and not try to promise you with some kind of a formula, uh, which would be a lie. It would be a scam. OK, uh, and we're definitely not into that. So um, this Lesson one will be what I hope an introduction and an inspiration session for this difficult time because a lot of you are stuck uh, in your studio focused on your music and your songs or your beats or your compositions or whatever it is that you do. And because of the bad things happening in the world today, you're also afraid for your career, for your possibilities. So you're so your vision narrows even further. And this is what I want to expand today. I want to inspire you so that you get optimistic, so that you get good energy flowing today, so that you see some ideas and possibilities for your future career. All right. So uh, questions. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm still learning how to navigate this thing. Questions like how much can I make? How do I break in? How is music for brands made? I'm not going to answer them here because I've already answered them in the free training. So if you haven't watched it, go to makingmusicforbrands.com and um, you'll find those answers there. In this training, I want to supplement it. I want to supplement that free training with 
more inspiration or things that I didn't have a chance to talk about in the webinar. All right, folks. So are you ready? I'm ready. I'm excited. Let's dive into it. Part one is going to be called Problems and Possibilities for Musicians Today and Tomorrow. So the first question I want to ask you is, because I, I hear a lot of people saying, is it harder than ever to make a living with music today? That's the question I want to ask you, because I hear a lot of people saying that, man, today it's harder than ever to make a living with music today. But, and I used to actually think that as well until uh, a friend of mine who actually owns Boombox uh, Studios in Toronto, a uh, wonderful musician and entrepreneur named Roger, uh, told me, uh, I don't believe in that. I think it's always been hard to make a musician uh, to to make a living as a musician. And I thought about it, and I went, you know what? That is very true. It's always been hard to make a living as a musician. It's never been easy. Every era has its problems and possibilities. Okay, every era, and the problems and the possibilities are different, as I'm about to show you for each era, but. There's never been a time when it was like a, a, you know, a walk in the park to become a full-time musician. There was never a time like that. It's just the way that you make a living, the way that the industry works has been changing. And so as somebody who aspires to be a professional musician, you need to be aware of the battlefield. You need to be like a wise general and understand what the trends are, what the industry is doing, what is trending upward, what is trending downward, right? A great philosopher once said, men lie, women lie, numbers don't lie. Can anyone guess who that philosopher was? It was my man, Jay-Z. And it is true, folks. Numbers don't lie. Notice how often you will actually research a piece of gear that you're about to buy. It could be headphones. It could be synthesizers. It could be a sound card. And you're looking at all of the, the numbers the frequency spectrum and the impedance and the decibels and all of that stuff, right? But you never actually look at the numbers in the industry. You don't check the frequency of the industry. You don't check the spectrum of the industry, of the opportunities, of what's going on in the world. If you're going to be a hobbyist, that's fine. I mean, you won't care about what's happening in the music business, you're just going to want to be excited about this new piece of gear. But I want you to, if you aspire to be a full-time musician, start thinking like a wise general. Start thinking, start thinking like Jay-Z. Start taking stock of the industry, the numbers in the industry, the trends, all of that stuff. Okay, Because you need to be aware of it in order to make the right decisions. But the big idea is every era has its problems and possibilities, okay? So let me give you an example of this. Back in the day, what was the problem? The biggest problem that I can sum up in one word was barriers, okay? Like 40 years ago, there was a barrier to making music. Not everybody could make music. You needed to have access to a studio, and a studio was expensive. Very few people could actually afford an hourly rate at a major studio in order to record their song. On top of that, even if you managed to record your song, there was barriers to the game. You couldn't just promote your single or your, your album on your own. It wasn't easy to have your own publishing company. It wasn't easy to get radio play. There were barriers. Those were the problems of um, the era that was before us, okay? But in that era, back in the day, the big possibility was sales. The entire, record in this, the entire record industry was driven by sales of records, right? People were buying music. And because people were buying music, record labels were handing out record deals, right? Um, radio stations were promoting singles. There was a big machine. It was a big machine happening, but everything was intended to sell a record because people were buying records. So whether it was radio airplay or touring or uh, even things like merch and deals with brands on the side were almost like on top of the record sales. The record sales were the main thing that was driving the industry, okay? So today, the problems and possibilities have flipped. 
they have literally flipped where the possibility today is that we don't have any more barriers, right? The average musician has access to music making tools. The average musician can publish their own music. They can create their own website. They can distribute their music to all the music platforms. They can have all their music distributed to all the stores online, right? You don't need anybody to help you promote with a savvy marketing strategy and a knowledge of social media and maybe some paid advertising. You can get the word out there about your music. But, but what is the big problem? The big problem today is sales, right? The record industry is no longer being driven by sales like it was before, okay? The traditional ways that basically kept the music industry going are no longer working. The landscape has changed completely. And so if, and I see a lot of musicians still functioning and operating and thinking as if we were living in the era of yesterday, where the possibility was that you could actually sell your records and that would drive your entire business as a musician. You cannot possibly survive, much less succeed, if you're going to have the same framework that was successful yesterday, today. Okay? If you, if you keep on doing the same thing and expecting a different result, that's called insanity. I think Einstein came up with that quote. I'm not going to argue with Einstein. A wise general is going to face the battlefield as it is with all of the problems and being sober about the problems and the reality of the situation, even if it looks dark and depressing. And then they're going to look for the opportunities. How can we win these battles so we can eventually win the war? So we need to face those problems. And that's how I want to start today, by looking at the battlefield. And I want to start with some of the problems, and then we're going to get into some of the possibilities, okay? So let's start with the problems. Number one, music business is down overall, especially in 2020, because of the lockdown, because there is a recession right now, the entire music business is down. And there are different figures uh, in place, but, you know, it doesn't matter what the exact percentage is. Some are saying it's 30%. Some are saying it's 25%. It's down, and it's down significantly. That's the first problem that we have to face. The second problem we have to face, I'm not sure if you can see this. Yeah, that's better. Is a source of income for a lot of musicians, live performances, concerts, tours, tours, they have been canceled. Canceled overnight, suddenly, and without warning. Okay, and this is a story that I hear over and over and over from musicians who actually join our masterclass because all of the live performances were canceled, and so all of their income disappeared overnight. You see how nobody saw this coming? And how if you were... Uh, somebody who was a wise general, a true CEO of your operation, you might actually foreshadow that earlier this year. You might actually go, hmm, wait a minute. This lockdown thing, I can't really depend. I can't put my whole livelihood um, into touring when, when these lockdowns are happening and wiping away 100% of my income overnight. And so that's why it's so important to face problems, guys, okay? I downloaded a report from RIAA, which is the Record Industry Association of America. I think uh, that's what it is. And just take a look at the numbers over here, okay, folks? Um, digital downloads, so sales of music, continued to decline in 2020, Okay. So this has nothing to do with tours. We're, now we're talking about sales of music. They continue to decline. The category share of total revenues fell from 8 to 6%. Revenues of $351 million were 22% decline versus the first half of 2019. Okay? What is this saying? It's basically saying that year over year, almost a quarter sales of records went down. Digital downloads. Okay? And what about physical products? Uh, this is in the same report, and you can look this up online. 
Revenues from physical products of 376 million at estimated retail value for first half 2020 were down 23% year over year. So again, almost a quarter down from last year. And I think this is a trend that's going to continue. Like, do you think people will start downloading and paying for more music next year? I don't think so. Do you think physical products will increase next year when you can actually stream them for free? I don't think so, folks. And so, like a wise general, we're going to we're going to uh, be sober about this reality, right? And and we're going to base our plans based on this reality. Okay. So streaming, streaming is up. Okay. Uh, streaming is going up, and it's no surprise if people are locked down at their home. Uh, what do they do? They consume more. They're not going to buy it but they're going to stream it, right? So we can see that streaming revenues grew 12% to $4.8 billion in the first half of 2020. That's pretty incredible. But if we are sober and wise as generals of our own music career, we're going to have to <laughs> take a closer look at these things called streaming royalties. And I already share how ridiculous the streaming royalties are in the free training. But if any of you want, you can go to Ditto Music uh, to this link here, okay? I mean, you know what? You can even Google uh, Music Streaming Royalty Calculator, and you'll see how ridiculous this is. You know what? Actually, let's go to this site. Let's check it out. I want to show you. Can I actually do this? Let's see. Oh. Here we go. Okay. So, yeah, here you have like a streaming calculator. Let's look at uh, YouTube, for instance. Let's say that you get a thousand streams, a whopping 69 cents. Wow. I mean, it's not even easy to get a thousand streams. It's pretty crazy. Let's say I get 10,000 streams, seven bucks. Wow. Incredible. Let's say I get 100,000 streams, which is like, you know, pretty respectable now. 70 bucks. I mean, yeah, you can see these are not figures that um, can consistently sustain you. I mean, and imagine if you have a family to feed on top of that. You can see that no matter which platform we're talking about, streaming royalties are calculated in less than pennies. Okay, folks? So I'm not trying to speak to people who who are relying on this way of doing things because there are musicians who are making money from uh, streaming royalties and it's a strategy, but it's not a strategy that I'm going to talk about, okay? To me, what reality is saying is basically <laughs> music isn't selling, tours are being canceled, streaming royalties are a joke. How do we find a way? What is the possibility for a musician today to make a living making music right from their home studio? And um, actually, I was researching about uh, streaming royalties, and there are a lot of musicians right now because there's been such a spike in uh, streaming royal in uh, streaming because of the lockdown. A lot of people are consuming music at home. A lot of musicians are now starting to fight um, the streaming platforms to get their fair share of streaming royalties. And here is an article on Pitchfork that you might want to check out. It's actually quite recent, June 29, twenty twenty how musicians are fighting for streaming pay during the pandemic. If this interests you, uh, you know, it might be worth checking out. But I want to keep moving on. I want to move on to the possibilities, okay? Let's see how I can get out here. Oh, there we go. All right. Possibilities. Let me just close this up to clean this up so that our workspace is tidy. Beautiful. Okay. So what do I want to convey to you in 2020 and beyond? I want to convey to you that you need to think bigger than just your beats, bigger than just your songs that you're working on in the studio. Because a lot of you, that's all you're attached to. You don't see the bigger picture. I want you to zoom out and I want you to realize the power and importance of sound as a whole to our civilization yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So I want you to appreciate sound as a cultural force. At the most basic level, sound is survival, right? 
And this is something that I do when I talk to potential clients, when I talk to brands, I deliver presentations. The first thing we do is make them aware of how central and important sound is to our civilization and how a lot of times sound is left until last. It's not being used intentionally by the brand. They get someone else to take care of it. It's always last in the process and there's no real appreciation for it. And so what I'm encouraging you to do as an aspiring musician who wants to have a career in the industry of brands is that if you become an evangelist and you're able to tell the story of sound better than somebody else, if you're more interesting when you talk about sound, if you're able to open people's eyes to the importance of creating certain sounds that move human beings, then you're going to be more likely to be considered as the person that they want on their team. So when I deliver these presentations, for instance, I will take things to the most basic level possible and I'll say, what's going to save you in the jungle? It's not going to be your eyes. Everything is green, right? It's sound that's going to save you in the jungle. That's how we are built. We're going to listen very intently for some uh, leaves rustling over there or, you know, uh, a sound um, that, that happens over here. We're going to turn our head and then watch for the predator, right? It's not going to be your eyes that can make sense out of, um, out of, uh, out of the jungle. It's not going to be our eyes that save us, right? And so, you know, really basic stuff, right? But it, it's kind of raising the awareness of an average human being because I think they maybe know this stuff deep down, but they kind of forget about it. So if we manage to survive, often it will be because our ears save us. Okay, so if we live to tell our story, we're going to tell our story to our grandkids around the campfire, right? So sound is also storytelling. So when I tell my story to my grandkids, and they will tell the story to their grandkids, what is sound responsible for? Sound is responsible then for identity, right? And the way this is true in reality is actually how do we express um, the identity of each nation through a national anthem. So that's how sound, the anthem is kind of like the culmination of, of sound is identity. And so when one nation's story or identity clashes with another nation's story or identity, we have wars, we have battles. And even there, we have instances of sound being used on the battlefield. As far back as the story of Jericho in the Bible, sound is mentioned. The horns of Jericho are, are said to bring down walls. And today, we actually have weapons in the military that use sound. They project certain frequencies to a very specific location. They can literally blow out your eardrums at worst. Or at best, they use these sounds or these uh, weapons, they're called actually LRAD, to disperse protesters. Okay, You'll see like a big plate on top of a, a police car uh, or more than a police car, like one of those trucks that, that is supposed to disperse uh, protesters. And you'll see someone on top directing this plate. It almost looks like a satellite. And that's an LRAD. That's sound being used as a weapon. And so uh, we have sound being used as medicine. I don't know if you uh, guys realize that ultrasound detecting, ultrasound is being used to detect illnesses. Well, this is sound at work. And when, post -opera, uh, when patients go through operations and they're healing, Sound can actually help them to heal faster. There's been research done about this, okay? Not to mention healing frequencies, uh, not to mention Alzheimer patients who can remember songs from their childhood, even if they can't remember their sons or daughters. It's quite incredible how powerful sound is. We obviously know that sound can be used as entertainment. We know that it, it's used to communicate. I'm communicating with you right now, modulating my voice, using sound to try to be credible, to try to be inspiring, to try to be uh, persuasive. I hope it's working. Uh, sound can be used as art. It can be the highest possible art, or it can just be wallpaper, or it can be elevator music, or it can be used just to sell stuff. But I want you to start thinking that way, to start expanding your horizons, that sound is more than just a song. 
It's more than just a beat. It can have many different applications, especially in the world today. Okay, so you need to actually think about becoming more than just a musician, but you have to start thinking about being an evangelist, someone who can awaken and inspire others to the importance of sound in every facet of our existence. And that means you should read books about sound, you should educate yourself on the power of sound and its different applications. And then I believe that if you're able to convey this information to potential clients, for instance, who you might be working with, they'll be like, oh man, every time I talk to this guy, he teaches me something new about sound. So I want to have him around. And I can tell you from, from experience that this is the way that I've worked, okay? Uh, whenever I worked on a huge project and I was looking at my Rolodex, my roster of musicians and composers, I always chose the people to join my team for that project who could teach me something interesting, who could share something new with me, because then I felt like I have a better chance of giving my client an edge by inviting these kinds of folks uh, into my team. And so this is why I'm saying be broader than just your beats, okay? Expand your horizons just beyond songwriting and really educate yourself on the power of sound. One book that I can recommend to you, I mean, there are many, there are many, and maybe I'll put some in the links below as resources, but um, How Music Works by David Byrne. You know, here is an example of a musician who had an incredible career uh, as a musician. And on top of that, his fascination went so much deeper and he wrote about it in the book. He was fascinated with all sorts of facets of sound. And so I want you to really think about that and get yourself inspired about sound and not just the way you've always thought about it, but in interesting new ways. Now, here's a very important part of this first lesson. We need to have an essential mindset switch if, you, if we have any hopes of surviving or succeeding in this brave, new, interesting world. We need to have an essential mindset switch, okay? And here it is right now, folks. I want you to write this down. I want you to, like, memorize this, okay? We need to stop selling music to people. We need to stop trying to sell music to people, and we need to start selling our musical skills to places, Okay, I think I mentioned this in the free training, but this is how Bach, how Handel, how Mozart lived their whole lives. They lived their whole lives as full-time musicians. And there was no record industry back then. There was no streaming. There was no touring. There was no records being sold. And yet they survived. How did they do it? Because they weren't trying to sell music to people. They were selling their musical skills to patrons. Okay, And so King's Churches are no longer patrons of musicians like they were back in box time. Today, the patrons are brands. This is what I'm always talking about. Remember how I said numbers don't lie? Let's take a look at what brands are spending these days on advertising. Let me see if I can zoom in here. Yeah, I can read this. So this, folks, is billions, okay? This is not thousands. This is billions. So Amazon... Okay, these are 2019 numbers, I think, because you can see this is a 2020 report. Almost $7 billion on advertising. Comcast, almost $7 billion. AT&T, almost $6 billion. Procter & Gamble, almost $5 billion. I mean, everybody on this list, down to Bank of America, at place, what, 25? Almost $2 billion. So there are 25 companies in the U.S. who have spent at least, well, I don't want to say at least $2 billion, but they've spent, they've spent at least a billion and a half dollars on advertising, okay? Numbers don't lie, folks. This is the most recent spend. We're talking about billions. And as you can imagine, millions of that is going to go to productions that require music. And music will be a significant portion and not just music, it might be sounds. Sounds might be a significant portion of that communication because that's what actually moves human beings. I mean, how could you ever move human beings by watching anything on mute? So I'm just trying to convey to you that 
brands are starting to realize this. They're starting to realize how important sound is. And not just sound, but sound that is distinct. How important it is for them to actually get your attention today. And so you can believe that some percentage of these billions is going to be spent on distinct sound that will help them to stand out in a noisy marketplace. And then we look at brand sponsorship of music. And you can see that from year 2010 to 2018, this number keeps going up. And we're not talking about millions, folks. We're talking about billions again, okay? So the number is what? Almost two billion in uh, 2018. This is not going to go down. Brands understand how powerful music is to the average person. And so they're going to use that to try to get into your heart and get into your mind. All right? All right, what's next? This is something that I've been researching recently because it's on the rise. The rise of voice and sound-driven apps. Okay? I was just reading this report. Let me take a look at it here with you guys. Speech and voice recognition market worth 30, almost $32 billion by 2025, okay? $32 billion by 2025. I mean, I find that incredible, right? So that's another thing to watch out for. And let's inspire you guys about all the different canvases that are hanging all over the world that actually require music. Because that's kind of how I look at it. It's like, where is music relevant? Where is it needed? Well, let's take a look. Let's get inspired, guys. Cars. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but it's a fascinating video about how Volvo actually designs the sounds inside of the car. Let's see if we can take a look at this here. We had really uh, interesting discussions, actually, or workshops, where we sat down and talked about what is Scandinavian sound. It's a tone. So after the workshops we had with the sound designers, uh, where we gave, from design, we gave our vision, uh, then we just... Uh, okay, let me skip forward to the really the cool right part. Thoughts. Watch this. Vision uh, around organic or nature sounds. For the turn indicator sound in our cluster 90 cars, uh, we actually went out to a forest just north of Gothenburg. Uh, we spent several days there uh, and we found this uh, fir branch which we could crack and then use as the turn indicator sound, which created this really organic sound. The sound should be a natural part of the car. You shouldn't really think of it, but it should, of course, be there. And it's, it's there to... Okay, guys, did you get that? They created the lane-changing signal from a branch in the forest. I mean, I don't know if any of you even realize that there is a guy right now that gets to sit in his studio and walk around the forest with a you know, high-quality microphone recording nature sounds and then translating them into the sounds inside the Volvo. I mean, this is what I'm trying to open your eyes to, that this is a real business and we don't have to just think about commercials we can really expand our horizons and see all the possibilities another example of of cars uh dealing with um intentional use of sound is audi and an engine uh you know a, an electronic engine that actually doesn't make any sounds so like what is that supposed to sound like when it's not a combustion engine right and so I really encourage you to take a look. Uh, this is Audi.com. I'm sure you can find this. You, if you type in sound of e-mobility, if you just type that into Google, you'll see um, how they go about. This is very interesting stuff. I mean, here's a guy, Rudy Halb Halbmir. I think that's how you pronounce his name. But he, was, he is responsible for the sounds of Audi. How the engine that is electric, that doesn't actually make any sort of sound, how it will sound. And I think there's a video here where this guy interviews him and they actually start working on the uh, sound. Check it out. Ah, okay. 
Aber das ist jetzt noch kein Fan. It sounds, it sounds like something out of Westworld, right? But um, yeah, just another example of how we don't have to limit ourselves in our thinking to just songs or beats or scores. There are people right now making a full-time living from designing the sound of an engine for, for, an, for, a, for an electronic car. Electric car, not electronic. Okay. Computers. Um, I don't know if you guys realize that when we used to turn on the Apple laptop, you know, that sound that it used to make, it was actually a C chord. Well, there is a guy behind it who was an Apple engineer who invented not just that sound, but many other sounds. And actually, he's a very interesting guy with a very interesting uh, blog The world reeks, reeks.net. You can check him out. Do you recognize this sound, for instance? Right? I remember that sound. Anyway, uh, this is the Mac startup sound. That I think went away for a while. Then they brought it back. Then it, way, it went away again. But he also designed the camera sound on the iPhone. I mean, everyone knows this sound, right? So this is very exciting, and I'd encourage you to go to reeks.net and check out this video where CNBC went into his uh, house and had a chat with him. His blog is very interesting, but again, this is, I'm doing this to inspire you to possibilities, that there are such a thing as, you know, interface sounds also that somebody is working on as we speak, and that's all a part of this business. But not just computers, software also, right? You guys know Skype. I don't know if you've ever seen this, which is basically uh, just an essay about how Skype came up with their sounds. You can find it on TheVerge.com. If you Google The Verge and uh, Skype, you will see a whole article about it and how they decided, uh, you know, how what the sounds should be like and what the process was. This is all very, very interesting stuff. And then they actually show you, like, uh, what all the different interface sounds are or software sounds. Everybody's familiar with these. Yeah. And then Skype for Business, which less people will be familiar with. But these are all delightful sounds, right? And I'm just trying to paint the picture for you of how big this world is and how many niche things are happening behind the scenes that you might not be uh, aware of. But there are people, real people, that have to come up with these sounds. I'm sure you guys know Brian Eno. Maybe some of you guys are too young to remember Windows 95. But Brian Eno, legendary producer, um, he was actually responsible for the startup sounds of Windows 95. And if you read the article with him, You can probably Google it online. You'll find it somewhere. Um, he loved the process. He absolutely loved designing what he called three-second songs, okay? Let's take a look. Yeah, here it is right here. Windows 95 by Brian Eno. Check this out. <laughs> yeah, so it doesn't sound like much, but the reality is all of those things are things that people are doing that brands are paying for because they believe it's important to the user experience. And they even hire people, legends, music legends like Brian Eno, to take care of these things. So beyond that, we have websites, for instance. I found you a couple of interesting um, uh, examples of brands who are telling their story in a really cool way uh, through a website. So let's take a look here. And I just want to use this to, to actually inspire you to, uh, that this is a possibility, right? Let's see. Where was this sound? Yeah, here we go. So right away, when I go onto this website, I get a certain feeling because of the sound. I start associating it with nature, right? With the forest, right? it immediately creates a connection with something that is organic, right? Just because of the sound, right? So I found that very interesting. So this is one kind of wine. Now, 
notice how when I switch wines, the sound ambience changes. Now I feel like it's colder. This is probably a nice wine, right? But see how the brand is telling their story through intentional sound? It's very lovely. And another possibility that exists for you musicians or sound designers to apply your musical skills for the benefit of one of these brands or businesses, okay? So that was one uh, website that I enjoyed. Let me see if I shut this down so it doesn't interrupt here. Here is another website that I found pretty delightful and refreshing because of their use of sound. So this is port, okay? And here we have to hold and drag to start. So here we go. I'm entering the, the world of this brand. And right away, I get a certain story in my head. Right? A certain atmosphere, a certain feeling because of the way there are very special places that music combines with the voiceover. I can see this story continuing here. I can jump forward. The music changes. The VO changes. I mean, it's just a very engaging way to tell this story. And whoever they were working with obviously appreciated the importance of music and how it makes you feel uh, to tell the brand story. So that's another thing to, to inspire your thinking about the possibilities why not suggest that idea to someone, uh, some kind of a business that you know is running a, a website and show them these examples and say, look how powerful music and sound design is to establish a certain setting, a certain story, a certain feeling, which will go much further than just a flat visual website. Then we have exhibitions, right? Uh, Exhibitions that actually have sound as a very central component of these exhibitions. So I found one um, as I was researching this. This is an expansive exhibition that explores the recent trajectory of sound as a dynamic branch of contemporary art practice. Man, I always love these artistic uh, descriptions. It's like a run-on sentence. But you can see that Nokia Bell Labs, um, which is a brand is sponsoring these art exhibits that involve sound, okay? So that's something that I'm actually familiar with because quite recently I was involved in a few different exhibitions where sound was needed and I had to compose a lot of music. And one of these was um, an exhibition called In the Footsteps of Jesus, which is actually translated because um, it was done originally in Polish, and it was originally presented in Warsaw, but essentially it took you through the life of Jesus, through these interactive rooms, which displayed all these artifacts from his life. But this exhibition needed tons of sound design and like 35 minutes of music, all of which I did, basically, in exchange for a handsome paycheck. So exhibitions is something that I want to add to your toolbox when you're thinking about, okay, uh, what are all the possibilities in the world today? I've done two exhibitions in the last two years with the same company that puts these exhibitions on, and I had a blast doing it, okay? And I can tell you it's a viable way to, uh, to make some money as a musician. Now, you might say, well, yeah, but now we're living with the lockdown, the pandemic, I mean... The exhibitions are being closed down. So I want to show you something really cool. And that is that some museums are actually taking their exhibitions online. And again, using sound in very interesting and powerful ways to immerse the viewer, the listener, into the experience. So check this out. So here we have Rembrandt's uh, Night Watch, right? And we're going to click start. 17th century. And Rembrandt von Rijn has created a masterpiece, a painting unlike any other painting. And look how immersive the visuals are, but how important music is the masterpiece still holds to actually make this painting inside. come alive. Join us in search of answers in Operation Nightwatch. Okay. 
And so here I can basically zoom in on any of these um, on any of these topics here, and it will take the me there. Guild the music will change. The voiceover will begin. Portrait. They might have known this artist would not follow traditional styles. Rembrandt's stubborn character would give us the very first ever dynamic civic guard painting. Yeah, so I just wanted result, to share this with you clearly to show you that even museum exhibitions are going online. That's another possible idea to contact your local art gallery. Ask them, are you guys doing some kind of a online interactive exhibition of your work? during these difficult times. And if you are, have you thought about your soundtrack? Have you thought about music? These are all ideas, folks. Not to mention that the explosion of podcasts and YouTube channels basically gives you also an opportunity to get to know some of your favorite YouTubers, some of your favorite podcasters. And if you know their style, and if you know what kind of um, show they're doing and what would be a great musical expression of that show, why not reach out to them? Why not make the connection? Why not say, hey, why don't you listen to some of this music? Because I believe, as a fan of yours, that this music will resonate with you, with your show and your audience, right? So there are so many ideas, guys. Today, there are so many opportunities. Yes, we have a problem. People are not paying for music. Yes, we have a problem. Tours are being canceled. Yes, streaming royalties are, are down. But remember, we talked about a mindset switch. We're not trying to sell music to people. We're trying to sell our musical skills as craftspeople to places um, for whom music might be useful, okay? So this is stuff that I want you to go away with and brainstorm it and do some research, Google, inspire yourself, see what all the possibilities are out there and how you can take advantage of them. But now I want to speak more closely about music for brands. Let me just close this here. Yeah. Let's get into the meat and potatoes of making music for brands because I just shared with you a bunch of ideas. I hope they inspired you, but you know, most of the action is actually happening in these three areas, especially campaigns and content, which we're going to leave to last. But I want to mention these areas so that you understand that this is where the action is taking place. So when we talk about making music for brands, one of the key areas that's emerging recently is sound branding, okay? Brands are now, I mean, a lot of brands have been aware uh, about sound branding and the importance of having an identity that is distinct uh, as far as sound goes. Mm, there are some brands that have been doing it for decades, but a lot of brands are now just learning about it. And they're like, hey, we should develop our own sound, right? And so you can look up all kinds of examples of iconic sonic branding, uh, sonic branding but just to, just to just to share a few that everybody will know. So, you know, everyone knows the sound of Netflix. Everyone knows the sound of HBO, right? But I don't know if you know this sound, the sound of Intel. This is actually a classic. In our industry, this is a classic. Like when we, when we talk about sound logos, everybody references Intel. This sound logo was made in the... When is it? 80s. Can you believe this? This sound logo was made in the 80s and it's still relevant. Okay, it's still playing. Uh, to me, that's incredible that 40 years now we've been hearing this sound and it serves as an effective signature for Intel. Okay, so that's, that's an example that everybody will know. I don't know how many of you uh, would have experienced this sound in the movie theater, but this is certainly a sound that I grew up with. I mean, hearing this sound on the proper sound system in a cinema is just an incredible experience. And you can actually see on this website here that they show the signature for the THX sound logo, okay? The, the score, the notes, which is uh, incredible to me. Uh, you will know the McDonald's sound for sure. Everybody knows this. I mean, I just want to awaken you to the idea that... There are musicians who are creating these sounds, okay? There are sound designers who are creating these sounds. 
This is a sound that's probably being heard in millions of households every single night, right? Same with this one, Xbox. So many of you will be familiar, <clears throat> excuse me, with that one as well. T-Mobile, of course. I another iconic sound logo. This one is a classic also. So basically, somebody is helping the brand as a um, subject matter expert to determine what sound are we going to use? Is it going to be musical? Is it going to be based in nature? But this is a real, real discipline. This is a real industry, folks. A lot of brands are into this thing now. And it's not just sound logos that brands are now uh, investing into but they're literally investing into creating their own signature songs what we call brand anthems they are investing into creating their own sounds so that the brand sounds the same for uh, in their commercial as when you turn on their product right so Philips is an example of that I had a chance to work with Philips directly and you can see the work on my website tommyz.co where we created a sound palette for Philips. And what do we create the sound palette out of? Out of a light bulb. And the light bulb was one of the first products that Philips ever went out with uh, on the market, okay? And so it was an incredible project, really inspiring. And, you know, we got paid handsomely for it. And so, again, I just want to inspire you to all the different possibilities that are happening in the world of music and brands. Also... Uh, when I was a creative director at Massive Music, <clears throat> O2 in Germany, which is a telecommunications company, which has like 400 stores across Germany, they paid us to figure out who they were musically, what their DNA was musically. And so we spent some time researching and figuring out what they could do musically, what kind of music could they play to differentiate themselves from T-Mobile, from Orange, from the competing uh, telecoms. And then we created playlists for them to play in 400 of their stores. A playlist for morning, a playlist for the afternoon, and a playlist that reflected who they were as a brand, what the values were that they wanted to communicate to their consumers. So you can see uh, the area of application for anybody who is a savvy musician or a savvy um, and sensible person who understands how sound and music can be used to express uh, something on behalf of the brand, the applications are endless here. Another area I want to point you to is experiential campaigns, okay? So I remember this campaign from a while back when uh, Volkswagen, sponsored, uh, Volkswagen sponsored this particular stunt, where they basically turn these stairs into a piano in order to encourage people to take the stairs more. Check this out. <laughs> I think this is pretty delightful, right? But it just gives you a... It just gives you another idea of the things that brands are actually willing to pay for as conceptual projects that are music-based, that do something for the people, they delight the people, they do something for the brand because then the brand is remembered as having sponsored it, and they do something for the musicians and the people who are behind this concept, right? It's kind of cool to think up these things and get paid for it and have a lot of people experiences. Another experiential thing that I've been personally involved, with, uh, involved in was a um, experiential sound concept that we came up with for Heineken. Basically, Heineken sponsors a lot of festivals, music festivals around the world, and they wanted to create a um, sound-driven experience for festival goers um, which was something more than just giving away like T-shirts and uh, beer coasters. They really wanted to to um, they really wanted to uh, have people. They what they wanted to do was contribute to the festival in a way that would delight all the festival goers. Okay, 
something that was really musical. And so I encourage you to check this out. It's here. It's called The Takeover. We're not going to watch this now because it takes a while. But essentially what it was is that we turned the crowd at the music festival into a DJ. Okay. We used Ableton as a centerpiece of this concept. And essentially what we did is created a DJ set, which was incredible. It contained all the biggest hooks in musical history in one perfectly mixed DJ set. And then uh, what would happen is every minute when the next song started coming on, we would create a decision moment. So huge um, portraits of artists would show up on the screen. And essentially the crowd would raise either a green a wristband or a red wristband in order to vote for whether they want to hear Michael Jackson or Miley Cyrus next. And then Ableton would blend the next song in perfectly, okay? The crowd had no idea how, how this was being done. All they knew was that there was a battle going on and they could influence which song is going to play next in the perfectly mixed DJ set. And so this is uh, one of those projects that I'm really happy about and really delighted about because, you know, it actually delivered thrills and goosebumps to people at these festivals. And this project won a bunch of awards uh, at fancy creative festivals. And this is something that Heineken was willing to pay for. They paid for this idea, right? And so I really want to make you aware that these opportunities exist and and just broaden your horizons, Okay. So now I want to get to the meat of what most people join our academy for, which is like, how do I make music for commercials and campaigns and brand content? Okay, because that's where most of the action is actually happening. And so I wanted to leave it to last because it's the most important thing. So as you remember from the free training, music production companies are your best friend. They are the sort of the middle person between all the musicians in the world and the brands and the agencies. Because as you will remember from the free training, the brands don't actually hire musicians themselves directly. That's, a, that's, a, that's an exception. 98% of the time, the brand is going to hire an agency, an ad agency. The ad agency will develop the creative idea then they will reach out to all sorts of creative partners. So somebody to shoot the idea, somebody to edit the idea, somebody to create animation for the idea, and somebody to create music for the idea. And so who creates music for most of the content and the commercials that you see online? Music production companies like mine that specialize in making music for brands. And so what you want to do is re research uh, the websites of companies like Massive Music, Human, Apollo, Grayson, Amp, Audio Force, Q Department, Song Zoo. There's plenty more. In our, in our masterclass, we actually have like 200 uh, music production companies listed in a directory that specialize in making music for ads. Uh, mine included, TommyZ.co. And so what you want to do to become familiar with the way things happen in our industry is you just want to go onto their websites and see what are they showing on their portfolio? What is on their reel? And then think about your own superpower, your own sound, and where you're coming from and see how you can match those two things. Is anything that you're doing in a studio something that is compatible with what these music companies are showing on their website. Because if so, that's what you want to show them. You want to show them that that is your superpower, that you're very good at this. Um, maybe give them some kind of an edge. Maybe you combine two different styles in a way that nobody's ever heard before. Maybe you do something interesting that hasn't been heard before. But the point is, before you approach these music production companies, don't make the mistake like I did. What I did is just I started emailing ad agencies. I started emailing brands. And I wonder why nobody ever got back to me, okay? That's what the industry insider had to basically sit me down and teach me, which is like, dude, no one's going to get back to you. Brands and agencies don't work with individual composers. They reach out to music production companies. You need to develop relationships with music production companies. And as soon as I did that, everything changed. A few months later, I was in the business, and the rest is history. So I actually spent, like, years, I think, researching the business and trying to understand the business, and that's something that I would also encourage you to do. Don't think that 
because this is a commercial, then it's some stupid jingle and you, your music is way better. And so that it should be easy to break into this business. What you don't realize is we have people at the highest levels of the game working in our business. Like there are Hollywood composers who get hired to do music for commercials. There are major artists who get hired to create music for commercials. Now, I don't want to discourage you because that doesn't happen most of the time. That is an exception. But even if it's not famous, well-known people creating music for a commercial, which is the case 98% of the time, it's not famous people creating music for a commercial. But even when it's not famous, these people that are creating the music, and I know them because I work in this business, they are world-class musicians, okay? And this is a real industry with its own quirks, with its own ways of doing things, with its own laws, and you need to basically become a student of this industry. You need to spend hours watching, listening, learning, crafting songs, scores, and sounds. Do it to existing commercials. That's what I did. Folks, when I was getting started, basically what I did as a practice is I took one commercial a day, and I, I scored one commercial a day, 30 or 60 seconds. After 90 days, what you're going to have is 90 demos, okay? You're going to improve your craft. When you have 90, when you spend 90 days doing a demo a day, you're going to improve your craft. You're going to have something to show whoever you're approaching as a potential collaborator or music production company. And even better, you're going to have an archive. You're going to have 90 pieces of music that sound like they could be in a commercial. And maybe, just maybe, as a way of starting your relationship, your working relationship with a music production company, they're going to ask you, well, you know, we don't want to take risk and pay you. We've never worked together before. But do you have something in your archives for this commercial? And maybe, just maybe, out of these 90 demos that you created, you have one that you can send them. OK, but I want to give you the idea that that's what it takes, folks. Like, it's not easy to break into this business. It's not overnight. You can't just send someone, you know, a link to your music and expect that tomorrow uh, everything is going to change. No, it's going to be difficult. But I believe if you have talent, if you have tenacity and you don't give up, your success might not be immediate, but it is inevitable. That's what I always say to my master class students. And some of them are starting to see it for themselves because they're now starting to get results and now they understand like it's not an easy road but when it happens it's a beautiful feeling and you get paid handsomely to create a piece of music uh, for a brand campaign okay so now let's go through some different types of commercials and different styles of music and i want you to see if any of these resonate with your style i want to show you how diverse this field is, um, how many, many different kinds of music end up in commercials. And I want you to watch these closely and listen to them with me so that um, we can see if any of these resonate with you and so that you can basically find yourself in one of these campaigns, okay? So I actually have my finder here where all of my stuff is. Yes, okay. So let me open this up and then minimize it. Yeah, like this. And then we pull up that. Okay, so let's start with singer-songwriter. And this is a commercial that I produced not too long ago for Honda. And uh, I just want to share it with you. You can also see it on my website. And just take a, watch, take a listen, take a look, and see. Hmm. Is this something that's up my alley? Is this something that I could be doing? Because this kind of thing definitely appears in our industry over and over and over again. So let's check it out. I'm not going to play the whole thing in the interest of time. You can check it out on my website. But here's the basic story. Want to spend with me. Show me places where I really want to be. So basically this story is about, you know, a girl growing up with her old Honda Civic and then the new car arrives 
And of course, uh, the young son is excited about it. What a piece of technology he runs toward it. The family is excited, you know, but the girl already knows. Uh oh, I'm gonna have to say goodbye to my friend. The car is crying. And, um,. This song is written by uh, Sean Christopher, and it was written for our production company, Tommy Z & Co, when we worked on this campaign. And Sean is a perfect example of a musician who, uh, you know, he's on the record label. He is leading an active artistic career, putting out music. You can find his music on YouTube, online. Just look up Sean Christopher. But his career actually got traction when he started writing music for Audi, when he started writing music for Honda. And in fact, some of the songs that he wrote for Audi and other brand campaigns, like Bridgestone, for instance, I produced a Bridgestone campaign with him a few years back, ended up on his future albums because they were great as pieces of music. He just had to extend them. So, you know, I want to dispel the notion that commercials are like crappy jingles. You have world-class artists that basically create songs that fit the commercial, that go on air, and then they end up as singles or songs on their albums because that's how good they are. So I want to dispel the notion that, you know, advertising music is somehow cheaper or less beautiful or artistic than what the artist would actually do, okay? So that's one of these songs that we wrote uh, specifically uh, for the commercial. Maybe you find yourself taking the path of a singer-songwriter, right? Maybe you say, you know what, I'm more of a uh, guitar god. I love heavy metal. I, ro I love rock. I'm a guitar player at heart, right? Check this out. Behold the power of a well-booked accommodation. Booking .com. Booking <laughs> so I always say never underestimate the power of a guitar solo. But look how simple and delightful it is, you know. Uh, my friend Stevie J played the solo on this guitar. Uh, he's my former colleague from uh, Massive Music. And uh, I think how much fun that was for him as a guitar player to lay down an incredible guitar solo for a 15-second commercial uh, where the voiceover is funny as hell and everything just works, right? It just makes you smile. So maybe if, you know, your main instrument is guitar, hey, you might find yourself doing spots like this. What if you're an orchestral uh, type of composer? Well, let's check this out. Another booking commercial. Brace yourselves, people, because this hotel has some amazing footwear. And how about the five-pound barbell at this resort? into soap this lodge has some and this hostel has ice cubes and this hotel has eggs if you're into it we know a place that booking has it liquid recreational sand electric wind aggressive relaxation that guy round things tanning apparatus whatever is going on in here Colorful beverage accessories, maximum plushosity, airborneness. Find that one thing that you and only you find awesome on Planet Earth's number one accommodation site, Booking.com. Booking. Yeah. So again, you you know, it just makes you smile. It's it's hilarious. It's great. It's intense. Uh, it's a fantastic campaign, and it was produced by uh, my friend. Uh, Chris Koss, who used to be a head of production, also a former colleague at Massive Music. And we worked with, or Chris worked with in this case, with a really um, talented composer uh, from the Netherlands called Eric Jan Hrop. Uh, I hope I pronounce his uh, name right. We just call him EJ. But a really talented guy who um, actually scores a lot of films. And uh, he's been nominated for a lot of prestigious awards in the Netherlands. Um, but yeah, this is how occasionally he uh, makes a living making music is by lending his talents to scoring these epic orchestral scores for these big brands. Okay, 
So that's orchestral. If you do orchestral, then you can see there's definitely an application for that in our world. Then the next thing is hybrid. By hybrid, I mean like a mix of orchestral and electronic, something that almost sounds like a, like a film score, right? And this is a case study that we actually share in our masterclass, and I, sh I show my students how we scored it. I show them the different layers, but I want to show you what I mean by a hybrid composition. This is not Rio de Janeiro. The Brazilian sun is a world away. This is our beach. The winter makes us who we are. The cold steals our resolve. The wind thickens our skin so that in the heat of the fight, all we feel is the fire in our hearts and the ice in our veins. So you can see here, this is a really elegant and impactful dance between you know, a bit of strings, a bit of sound design, a bit of electronics, and uh, it all combines together into a very dramatic um, campaign that produced a lot of goosebumps, and it's one of the biggest things on my reel, and it's gotten me a lot of work also. Um, so if, if, you know, if this is your sound, then rest assured that there are going to be projects in our business that um, you'll definitely uh, find yourself in, that you'll find opportunities for, okay? The next up is uh, electronic, electronic music. And uh, this is, again, one of the favorite things that I've done on my reel. I didn't uh, make the music for this. I was responsible for the music for it. But I work with, um, uh, again, this really talented duo from uh, Netherlands. They're called Line 29. And um, we created a campaign for uh, Japan, for Toyota which a lot of people are talking about when they go to our website. So this is for all you folks who love electronic music. And I want you to pay attention to the fact that these tracks were written specifically to picture. So every part of the song works and fits like a glove to each part of the picture. The music is actually de there to help the picture tell the story, right? So I want you to notice here how the music is really going to accelerate, elevate and intensify the emotions here. I mean, I still get goosebumps when I watch this, you know what I mean? The combination of the visuals, which are magical and enigmatic, and the sound, which is at first enigmatic, and then later on it just gets intense, and it's otherworldly. It really takes you to a different place. You know, it, it really makes me feel like, man, I'm excited to be doing this for a living, you know? And so if you make the kind of stuff that sounds like this, folks, you're going to find yourself uh, projects in this business for sure. Now let's talk about all the people who make urban music, who make beats, who make hip hop. Uh, this is a commercial that was produced once again by my friend Chris, uh, when we were at massive and I actually had the pleasure of rapping on this. Okay. So I wrote the hook and I made the guest appearance as a rapper in this commercial and it was wonderful. Check it out. Hey, tourist! I want that. In return, you come to my palace. To my palace. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> he's not going to give up his shokomel for, for the palace. But um, there you go. So if you're wondering, hey, do beats, does urban music, does rapping appear in commercials? As you can see, it does. And I, I could uh, actually uh, go back to my glory years as a rapper in high school and relive those moments by appearing in the booth again. Uh, but this time I do it for a commercial for a Dutch brand uh, that does chocolate milkshakes in a can. Let me show you another amazing example of a hip hop track that was written specifically for a spot. Okay. And this is again produced by my friend Chris uh, when we were at Massive. And um, I'm sharing it with you because I love it. And I think, you know, it's, it's just a great example of like how you write a hip hop track to fit the needs of the story and the picture. And you'll see what I mean here as you watch this. What it is. What? No! What you talking about? You need to take a picture. Look, look. Hold on. I told you. Once my regular was fat, I get the new whip. Watch the milkshake on the ostrich leather, brother. <laughs> Woo! You ever seen Back to the Future? Yeah. yeah. My car is future to the future. Take this shit. Stop the car. No, 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 what? No, you don't stop this PPC, baby. Personal voice control. Please Watch stop. this. What? Start the car. <laughs> <laughs> This is a commercial for an insurance company. <laughs> but everything you hear in this commercial was written for this commercial, okay? And you can see how central the lyrics are, the hook to the concept of the commercial. And so things like this happen. They don't happen as often as, you know, like maybe uh, the singer-songwriter stuff or the orchestral stuff, but they do happen. And when they happen, if you're the kind of person who can write hooks and beats and instrumentals to this kind of campaign, you're going to find yourself getting these kinds of projects, all right? So uh, let's check out the next commercial here. Some of you might be going, okay, well, you know what? I'm not really into the singer-songwriter. I'm not into the metal. I'm not into the electronic. Uh, I'm not into the urban. I'm a jazz musician at heart, okay? So do you have anything for me? So I want to show you now a campaign that I produced uh, recently. Uh, not too recently, actually. It's, uh, it's actually like five years ago, but because uh, I don't do a lot of these. But I want to show you that they actually exist. And there are many examples of jazz music in the world of music and brand. So check this out. ほとんど I mean, you get the idea, right? Basically, we wrote a little jazz tune that is really delightful when you put it up against this picture and these uh, friends basically running around town causing trouble, okay? And so I'm sure there are plenty of examples of jazz. I mean, I've done a few of these campaigns. I remember I did a, a jazz track for... Uh, an original jazz song for McDonald's uh, a few years ago also. Um, so these things ha happen quite a bit. So if you're a jazz musician, 
my message to you is fear not. You might be able to find traction because uh, it appears over and over. Another thing that you might hear in commercials uh, that you uh, might have as a superpower is music that sounds like it's from another era, but it was actually written specifically for the picture. So I've done these a few times, and I want to show you an example of this. This is for YKK. So this sounds like a film score from back in the day, you know, something vintage, charming, classic, classy. You see what I mean, right? It sounds like it would be in a film from many, many decades ago. So those kinds of things tend to happen once in a while. And also this one here, which was a very difficult campaign, very challenging musically, because the film director wanted something that sounds like it's an original song from Frank Sinatra. Okay, check it out. Come let us roam the day together, follow me. So this was my friend in Los Angeles who makes a full-time living making music for brands. His name is Naren. He's actually a part of our master class. Uh, we interview him. We show you some case studies. But he wrote the arrangement, the composition, and then we found the perfect voice for it. I'm sorry, but I can't remember the gentleman's name. It was a few years back. But just to show you as an idea that sometimes you will be required to create a track that sounds like it was made back in the day, but is actually made for the commercial, maybe this is your superpower. Maybe you sing um, uh, like Frank. Maybe you have uh, the ability to sing and have that vintage character in your vocal. Or maybe you're able to produce vintage tracks. If so, fear not, because they appear in commercials as I just showed you. And then in the end, I'm going to show you a campaign that's also a part of our masterclass uh, where we actually give it to people as homework. We break it down um, as far as, you know, how the process went about of creating a song for this. This was a very challenging campaign for an insurance company called AIG, which featured the famous uh, all Z uh, the New Zealand All Blacks uh, rugby team and the requirement for this campaign was to write a track that was kind of like Hocus Pocus. I don't know if you guys know this uh, track, but it's a vintage rock track uh, called Hocus Pocus, which is just impossible to try to imitate. You know, it's impossible to try to create something like it because it's such a wild track. And so we, act we actually had to write like eight or nine songs before the film director actually went, okay, you know what? This is starting to work. So take a listen to this and see if maybe this kind of sound and musical style is something that you'd be capable of doing. Now remember folks, this is not sync. We didn't pick this track up from a library. This is written specifically for the campaign. And you can see how the track is twisting and turning with the needs of the picture while still sounding like it's one track. So it actually doesn't sound like a score. It doesn't sound like a jingle. It sounds like a real track that maybe we licensed from somewhere, which just happens to coincidentally fit with the picture. Well, the truth is we wrote the track uh, to this film.
So you can see it's a very dynamic track with different sections, very colorful, and it, believe me, folks, it wasn't easy, okay? Not for the composer, not for us, because like I said, we wrote like nine or 10 tracks to try to get this music right. And finally, this is the track that landed. And so maybe this is your superpower. Maybe you're listening to this track going, hey, I love uh, shredding. I love uh, writing vocals or uh, singing. I love doing vocals. I love writing lyrics. And if that's the case, then again, I showed you an application of what your superpower uh, might translate to in the world of music and brands. Okay, so let's go back now to our to our mind map here, this big mind map that we have. And um, uh, also one thing I wanted to share with you in addition to the music is sound design. Let's not forget about sound design. Maybe some of you are out there going, you know what, I actually enjoy doing sound design, not music, but sound design, you know, shaping sounds from scratch. And I want to share you the work of um, one of the best sound designers in our game, um, and just check out this Google commercial. I just love this kind of stuff. I mean, this is really, you know, you can really tell that sound is the primary moving force of our emotions, of the goosebumps, right? So so sound design is something, as you just saw through these Google campaigns, that definitely exists in our business. And in fact, just recently, brands are becoming so hip to how important sound is that they are starting to use niche sound trends like ASMR. I don't know if you guys heard of ASMR, but it's becoming a huge trend right now in, um, or it's becoming, it's already a huge trend in the world with various YouTubers doing ASMR. If you don't know about it, Google it. But I want to show you a Super Bowl commercial from Michelob, I guess. I don't know if that's the way you pronounce it, but check out what they're doing here. And that's all it is, folks. It's literally just ASMR. So, you know, miking things really closely. And even big brands on Super Bowl day are getting into this stuff. There are other um, examples of this. You can go on to trendhunter.com, uh, Pro Trends, ASMR. You can see how different brands like KFC are using uh, ASMR and these, you know, really detailed granular sound design in order to convey their message. But that's essentially uh, what I wanted to cover here as far as showing you, you know, how things sound on the inside and, and, and challenging you to figure out your superpower and to see, okay, which one of these things am I most likely to do if I was to break into this world, okay? And I want you to really, really practice on those. Like, see if you can find more commercials like this, download them and score them or write a song to them or sound design them so you can start building a portfolio. Okay, folks, so I want to uh, bring this to an end because we're together together already, uh, looks like uh, over 90 minutes, okay? I didn't intend for this to be this long and future lessons will not be this long, but I feel like the first lesson has a broad introduction and inspiration session uh, had ran... ran 
you know, it, it risked being so long. And in fact, it, it is uh, uh, a bit long, but I hope that you're still with me and I hope that you're inspired, most importantly. So key takeaways from our session today. Every era has problems and possibilities, okay? As people who aspire to be professional, okay, because I assume most of you are aspiring to be professional musicians, making a living from music, we have to face the problems, but we don't focus on the problems. We focus on the possibilities. The problems today, we can't sell music to people because people are streaming it for free. Streaming royalties are a joke. People who rely on uh, performing live, uh, well, they're getting their the rug pulled from underneath them suddenly without warning tours are being canceled. So what we need to do is have a mindset shift. We have to start thinking about selling our musical skills to places that need music and are willing to pay for it and not still trying to sell our singles for pennies to people who are already streaming it for free. So the possibilities today, this was what the presentation was all about. There are plenty of them. Brands are investing in music. They're investing in sound. They're investing in sponsorships. You saw that those numbers are going up and they are in billions, okay? Voice is becoming a huge billion dollar industry 30 billions i think projected to be 30 billions uh, by 2025 hardware we saw that sound is being intentionally crafted for cars for phones for smart devices for alexa for okay google i don't even know what that device is called for computers and not just computers but software right websites Online and offline exhibitions are using sound and music intentionally. We looked at sound branding. You're all familiar with iconic sounds of brands like Netflix and MGM and HBO and McDonald's. This stuff is happening all the time, folks. Experiential campaigns, also a possibility. But of course, the bread and butter of the average musician that is working inside of our industry is composing original songs, scores, or sounds for campaigns and content in every possible musical flavor. And I shared a lot of different musical flavors uh, for you so that you can figure out, you know, where do I fit in? So hopefully this whets your appetite and hunger to do your own research, to discover your own possibilities in the world of making music for brands and in this brave new world in general. And really, you know, this is up to you. As a as someone who aspires to be a professional musician, it's up to you to understand where this world is going, where the music industry is going, where is the demand for sound, where can it be especially helpful, and who is willing to pay for it. And if you get into the mindset of thinking that way and not just focusing on your studio and your songs and your beats, but thinking broadly, okay, and thinking where is going to be the next outlet for music and how can I make myself relevant and useful in this new marketplace, if you do this on a regular basis and you take initiative and you do your own research and you create relationships within this business, and we're going to talk about how to create these relationships in upcoming lessons, then success might not be immediate, but it is inevitable. Okay, folks, we're going to end it there. That's our first lesson. I hope that you stuck around, and if you did, I congratulate you because you're showing patience and dedication. In a few days, I'm going to surge, send you part two, and I promise it's not going to be as long, and that's going to be orientation. I'm going to share with you some essential skills, tools, traits in and out of the studio that I've observed in the people who are most successful in our business. All right, folks, I'll see you in the next lesson. I'm Tommy Z, and I hope you're safe and well wherever you are. Ciao.